So the book first, so hello everyone, welcome to the graphics, no, sorry, <laughs> that's my other club. Welcome to the programming language meetup. And today's topic is the uh, book, Quality Interpreters, Chapter 9, Control Flow. And last, the book first starts by saying that the last chapter is really hard, long. Well, it's not hard, but it's just long. And today, today is lighthearted, even though it's still not short, but it's shorter than the last chapter. And also it finally had features to make our language Turing complete. Depend on your, your background, you may say yay or something like ah, that's Turing completeness sucks. So, but then the book start to have a, like primer on Turing machines and all those kind of theoretical stuff like in the early part of last century, people start to formalize thing, formalizing things. For example, in the set theory, there's the Russell's uh, paradox, which is the side note here, where it says the R is a set of all sets that do not contain themselves. Then does R contain itself? It's and also like for Russell's paradox, there is a uh, analogies to the like a barber, like only a barber that cut hair for all people who don't cut hair for themselves. So it's the same kind of stuff. And the, then basically the at the end at the end this Russell's paradox is resolved by saying that a set just cannot contain itself. So next time you can say, hey, I learned about this theory. Now I cannot contain myself. <laughs> But anyways, people start to formalize those kind of things. And then in the computing, well, the big problem is what kind of functions are computable? And two big uh, big names in this area is Alan Turing and Church, where they invented uh, one is Turing machine and another is Lambda calculus. And then people find they are actually equivalent. And we call a program that that it's expressive uh, enough to be Turing complete, which is like have the expressiveness of the Turing machine or lambda or lambda calculus, and we basically need to, like do we can do some calculation. We already can do that, but also we need control flow, which currently we have. No way to jump back and forth uh, in our program. So that's what we'll fix in this chapter. And also we need the ability to use arbitrary amount of memory, allocate and use memory.
And today, today we we just add the second one, the control flow. So first, first we will talk about uh, what kind of control flow we can have. There are some uh, like non-conditional, uh, non-conventional control flows, but we will not talk about those. Uh, in in logs, there is there are just two kind. One is the conditional or branching control flow, another is looping. Just Uh, just like most programming languages. Branching is simpler, so we will start in here. In C-like languages, usually we have a if statement and also a, a ternary operator, uh, which is expression. And for simplicity's sake, logs only have the if statement, which I, I agree, we can't just have one if to rule everything. Though in this case, I will probably make if an expression. Well, then he goes on to implement the logical and and or in a way that's almost like a conditional operator. It seems like it wouldn't really be that much harder to have a real conditional operator after that. Yes. Sorry, sorry, I don't get what you are saying. <laughs> well, we, we, I mean, we haven't gotten to it in the chapter yet, but they do, he implements and and or in a way that yeah. or expressions evaluate not to true or false, but to one of the two values in the and and or like a ternary operator would. Yeah, well, this is a common, common kind of dynamically type of language thing, like, for example, in DS, you write a lot of this kind of code. Mm. We are using this property of and and all to return the uh, object sometimes. So we just add the if into our grammar. In this case, uh, in this is uh, like the automatic generating the AST. We this code and it will just generate AST where the if expression has the condition you no, know, and then two branch which are statement. And then some parsing code, so pretty trivial. Uh, now, this aside is really interesting. We talk about the trade-off of designing the if expression or statement. So you need some, so in the logs, the choice is add, to add parentheses like this. So, so it's most C-like languages. However, there, uh, the actually the like open parenthesis is not useful. The only the closed parenthesis is used to because we need some kind of delimiter between the condition and the then statement. Otherwise, the parser can't know we reach the end of condition. But the open one is the open one is not useful, but it's just aesthetically more pleasing. Other languages have different choices. For example, a lot of languages use the keyword like then, or in case of Python, it's uh, what's that? What's that in part? It's, it's this, 
and uh, in Go and Swift and also Rust, they don't require parentheses, but require the statement always in a braced block. Which also since a lot of like C and C++ uh, or other similar languages uh, code convention require people to do that anyway, it can be a good thing. And then it, it just omits a parenthesis. So this is one issue of designing the syntax of if. And then there's another problem. Which is more related to the semantics of the, the ambiguity here. So what this else belongs to, there are two questions. One is that we can attach that to this if. So if first fail, we go to here. Another is that we can attach it to this if. Then if first succeeded and the second fail, then we go to here. So this is called uh, uh, dangling else problem. Apparently it's pretty famous because it has a Wikipedia article. And the book further comments that it is possible to define a grammar that avoids ambiguity directly, but it requires splitting most of the statement rules into pairs. When that allow an if with an else and when that doesn't, then this sounds really annoying and no one do that. Instead, most languages and parsers avoid the problem in an ad hoc way. Uh, but we always choose the same interpretation, the else is bound to the nearest if. So we always choose the interpretation that else is bound to this if, not this, because this is more, more intuitive. This version is considered more intuitive than this. Even though I think not this, this is a like smaller problem than it used to be because we just use auto formatters for everything. But I guess for intent based language, it can still be a big problem. So then for the interpretation, we just say we just evaluate the condition first and if it is choosy, then we execute the damn branch, otherwise we execute the else branch. But the else branch, but one thing is the else branch is optional. So we need to check that whether it exists first. And we talk we talk about this like uppercase void and now in last chapter, that's just a Java thing.
And after that, we start to talk about uh, logical uh, logical operators, and and all. They are not like normal binary operators because they short circuit. So we also can say they have like lazy semantics. Now I guess it's not lazy semantics because the first part is eager. We always evaluate the first part, the left-hand side, but if the left-hand side is false, then we don't need to evaluate the right-hand side. And for all, it's like the, if the left-hand side is true, we don't need to evaluate the right-hand side. Uh, the new the two new operators are uh, low in the precedence table. We we similarly put them between the assignment and the equality. And there is a side comment about. I've always wondered why they don't have the same precedence. And I think in one of the previous meeting we talked about before that maybe maybe it's a good idea to leave those things as like non-associative and we just cannot use, we just cannot like use them in like concatenation because it is it is pretty confusing. We can use the binary class for the new uh, new expressions, but then the visitors visitor need to check whether it's a logical operator or not to handle to handle the short circuiting. So instead we have a new node with their own uh, with their own visit method. And for the parsing, I think I think for the parsing part, it's like just like parsing the binary expression. It's nothing different, except we return this rather than the uh, binary expression. Oh, but we also need to consider the precedence since we use uh, we use our grammar to with the precedence. That's why we need to do this kind of polyplate code, like again and again. And, and um, Oh, and then the other interesting piece is that the actual value to uh, the, our binary, uh, our uh, operator evaluated into a uh, not true and false, but instead since log is dynamic state typed, we can, we can evaluate to arbitrary types, like different types for the same operator. So in, in here we evaluate into, 
in here we value change to the string and in here we also evaluate into a string. I guess but it's just um, It's just like it is the uh, the type it it actually evaluates to is decided at the runtime, and every type has a trueness, so that's why this thing can work. And as I said before, this is a common pattern in like JavaScript land. Now, now let's talk about loops. Again, we add it to add it to the syntax. With a while loop is uh, just a conditional expression and the body. And uh, the parsing, the parsing is straightforward, and uh, and uh, also the interpretation is just using the Java's while loop. I guess the only thing worth noting is that we need to use Trucy, since our conditional can be some arbitrary type. And then we talk about for loops, which is like uh, just like three component C style for loop. And there is a side note about like most modern languages have a higher level loop, looping statement, like uh, C sharps for each, C++ rent for loop. But for logs and again, for simplicity sake, we won't have those. And for support of those, we need something like object method or like iterators. We have none of them. So again, it's not even possible to support those uh, range based for loop yet. But for loops, even though it looks complicated, it is actually, we don't need to implement its interpretation, but instead there is a disturbing process where the for loop can be transformed into a while loop like this. where the initialization part can go into the before condition state here and the increment part can be after the body. And uh, it has the exactly same semantics as the previous one. So this process is called distributing.
and uh, and then we just we just do the de sugaring strictly in parsing instead of introducing a new syntax tree node which in our simple interpreter can work, but in like more complicated case, we probably need, want to preserve this information for like, for example, error reporting purpose. But in our simple, in our simple case, we just like directly to show in our parsing where we, We, where we just in, in the parsing directly um, We should directly return the uh, while, but I, I don't see where. Oh, it's here. We directly return the while. The condition is here and the body, body is like we create, create a new block where uh, the original body is the old block. And then because afterward we need to add the increment. So uh, I have a question about yep. desugaring. Yeah. Uh, so like, uh, you know how when uh, you have tail recursion and that turns into, you know, that, that translates into a loop yeah. uh, in, in some, some languages, is, is that like a kind of desugaring or, or, or no? Uh... I think it depends, but I think in most of those languages know because okay. it's a it's a compiler transformation. Like you, uh, well, I guess Dishugin is also a compiler transformation. But like, can you dump the source of the? You can always dump the source of the disugared uh, structure, and it should still be a valid. Uh, source program, like you can rewrite for for loop into a while loop, right? But in functional languages, you can probably not write loops directly. It's right, the compiler right. is doing the work. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. It, it's it's not desugaring because you can't represent the for loop in in that language. Yeah, yeah the language that's... don't have that semantics. Because otherwise, like everything becomes disturbing. Everything compiler does is like transforming a program from one form to another and to another to another. another. It's all disturbing, <laughs> but that's not the case. Right, right. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, so I guess the sugaring is only for like AST level transformation. What after that, if you can't represent that the result in AST anymore, then it's not the sugaring. So then there's a design note about syntactic sugar. So, the, so it basically says that a lot of people like the minimalism will just, they just dislike syntactic sugars and other things makes the language so-called complex. And 
There are other languages. There are other languages that try as add as much syntax sugars as possible, and it's further common to some degree. Location on the spectrum correlates with age. So because it's easy, always easier to add syntactic sugar to a language. Rather than like changing semantics. And also mentions that if you ask people in the PL circle, they usually hate, they usually hate uh, syntactic sugars and like minimal languages. But also, if you ask other developers, they may have very different opinions on this matter. Also, also like I think, I think it's interesting. Like if you ask people whether syntax sugar is good or bad, they probably say it's bad. But if you ask people whether a specific feature is good and bad, like is C++ range for loop better than the three component for loop? And people will probably say, ah, yes. <laughs> so I guess this is just something, something to consider, but really since it's a matter of opinion, I, I don't know much if we are designing a language we can do. It's basically what our opinion is, what kind of trade-off we want to make. And yeah, I think we are done with this chapter. Now this is a 